Great. So we are joined now by Dr. Albert Palazzo, who is an adjunct professor in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of New South Wales, Canberra. And he has recently written a paper on Australia's choice of infantry fighting vehicles for the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, otherwise known as ASPE. Uh, we will have links down below um, for that paper. Um, but Dr. Palazzo, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, just to get us started, can you walk us through a little bit of what defines an infantry fighting vehicle and why the Australian Army is getting into them in 2022? Uh, this is a vehicle that uh, you know, the Australian Army doesn't actually have in its current inventory. We have, you know, what M113 APC, yeah. uh, APCs or um, uh, protected mobility vehicles. But this is an entirely different kind of generational leap in capability. Now, this is a vehicle that carries people, soldiers, um, in the back and is tracked like a tank and has a turret like a tank uh, carrying um, you know, probably a 30 millimeter gun and a machine gun. It's the, the concept here for it is that it will allow infantry to fight to the objective to ride in the vehicle if need be all the way to the objective and get out on the objective or even roll through the objective into the rear and then dismount in the enemy's rear, um, which is these vehicles come with a high degree of armor protection, which uh, you know, allows them to do this. Whereas the 60-year-old um, the M113, uh, which is, you know, beyond obsolete at this point. I'm not sure what the word is after obsolete. Dangerous. Uh, you do that. <laughs> now you have to get out some distance from the adversary and uh, the infantry has to walk forward and then fight their way to um, outside of the vehicle, you know, fight their way on foot to the objective. So this is a faster, more secure, and hopefully more powerful um, way to fight. And this is also the way every other modern army does it at the moment. Um, so Australia is playing catch up in this kind of, in, in this part of modern land warfare. Australia's always, uh, previously, uh, a generation ago, Australia's always seen itself as having light infantry and uh, without a requirement for uh, the idea of having heavy or mechanised infantry, only having uh, five, seven RAR as the actual, um, well, uh, uh, what it was back then, five, seven RAR as the, uh, the mechanised infantry. Nowadays, we're going far more into either the mechanised infantry role or uh, the cavalry role whereby they can pick up uh, uh, dismounted infantry uh, battalions and actually uh, advance them forward with the cavalry. Um, that's a big change for Australia and saying, yes, if you want to get in, uh, which essentially why there wasn't a lot of involvement in Gulf War One back in 92, um, whereby the 91-92, uh, whereby uh, Australia didn't have the equipment to be able to deploy overseas to those sort of environments where it was a highly armoured, highly mechanised environment and which when invited uh, whereas nowadays, uh, every, um, if we want to get invited to those sort of conflicts, uh, not that I'm saying we do, but <laughs> yeah, the government uh, is looking at it and say, look, uh, we want to be able to have our place on the world stage and uh, be involved in this. If we're going to get involved, then we can't just have uh, light infantry walking around the hills of uh, Afghanistan. We've got to be able to actually put um, some uh, mechanised infantry on the ground or uh, to be able to move it around in a protected environment. Do you think that's one of the issues that's going on here? Well, I, I think there's two things at work here. Um, and uh, they're both interrelated. So the first one is that um, Australia, the ADF, the Australian Defence Force, the Australian Army, and the Australian government all got seduced by the idea that we could go to war and war wouldn't be terribly dangerous, that we could control the environment to the extent that we could you know, achieve objectives while also minimizing casualties. And that's what you see in our parts of Iraq and Afghanistan, a relatively low intensity war in, against a relatively low threat 
and with a heavy degree of management on the part of the government deciding what we could and could not do. And the other thread here is that the government really since uh, John Howard and the decision to go to war in Iraq um, has consistently signaled a desire for casualty minimization that um, you know, either you know, even one or two or three or that day in Afghanistan when five Australians died, that, that is you know, always going to be too much. You know, one um, Australian killed in action is, is more than that should be occurring uh, because you know, the government wanted no casualties or zero fatalities. That's just and like that's in, why um, we're... Just like in 1966 in the Battle of Long Tan when 18 Australian, 18 Australians died, it was a big moment for, yes. uh, for the government. Um, yeah. The, the M113s having been, were in at that battle and uh, uh, had only been introduced into the Australian Army in 1965, so only a year in with, yeah. uh, uh, with uh, in operations. But now we come in. The M113... The M113 you know, would just simply not survive on a contemporary battlefield. No, no. aluminium, as aluminium hull. And, uh, yeah, so yeah. As, as we're seeing, the lethality of the modern battlefield um, has become much more intense. It's much more lethal. And wars where the adversary is, um, like in Afghanistan, um, a lightly armed uh, you know, insurgency, um, yeah, they don't pose a, a real a, you know, serious threat. You know, but you don't get, the, you know, you don't always get the war you want. And usually the enemy also gets a vote. And so we could, you know, Australia could easily find itself in a, another war in the future in which the adversary comes with quite heavy weapons and quite lethal weapons. And the only way to survive in that kind of environment is upgrading your land forces to be able to be able to take the battlefield. Yeah, there's, the, a, there's, like, there's, there's some discussions about there's some discussions about whether or not Australia should be getting involved in those sort of conflicts. Um, but that's a, well, that's, you know, a that's, that's a different like that's a different decision. discussion. Yeah. But yes, it's a different discussion, and it's also a decision for the you know, for the politicians to make. It's up to them mm. to decide what kind of wars we go to, mm. but often there's a lot of surprise in war. And, you know, even, um, you know, in, you know, uh, you know non-state actors now have fairly easy access to relatively powerful weapons that could incinerate a, a Bushmaster um, or a Aslav and certainly uh, eliminate in it, you know, a, an M113. So, uh, yeah, speaking, so speaking. Know, the question the government is asking is, how do we survive on the modern battlefield? And the IFV is a potential answer to that. Yeah. Uh, speaking well, speaking quick, about as that. Okay. Um, sorry, John, you go. You've been quiet. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Al. Um, you know, wonderful piece of understatement <laughs> in your article. You did mention that twenty-seven billion dollars is quite a lot of money. Um, it is. It's and this is like a third more than we're spending on our fleet of um, F thirty fives. It's it's a colossal defense expenditure. Yes, well, there's there's two things um, working here. Uh, one is you know the the army um, is much too honest about costs. So that twenty seven <laughs> billion. I like those damn navy folks. Uh, you know that term twenty seven billion covers pretty much everything uh, for, you know, it is not the sticker price. It is not going to the, uh, the IFV car you know, yard and buying um, uh, 450 of them, right? Okay, it includes the training costs, the new facilities, uh, the logistics support. Um, uh, it includes replacements for in case any of these do get blown up. So, it's a full figure. Whereas as you mentioned the joint strike fighter being around 35 billion billion. But that figure is is just simply nonsense. Uh, because the, uh, the the RAF very cleverly neglects to include all kinds of additional costs that it then covers with supplemental budgets. So we actually it's very almost impossible to figure out what is the joint strike fighter costing. Uh, because uh, it's spread out into numerous programs. 
um, and uh, that are constantly evolving um, and, and, and all the upgrades that are coming for it, like the software upgrades that are required that are issued by Lockheed, all of these are costing extra money uh, that were not in the uh, purchase price. So, you know, saying that uh, the, you know, the, these are very expensive, absolutely. Uh, but at least you know that this is what it's going to cost you. Now, I've got two questions with the um, uh, with going to the track vehicles or uh, with the uh, Redback or the Lynx. Um, first off is Australia previously with the ASLAB and then the Bushmark, Bushmaster uh, went with um, wheeled vehicles. Now, I can see a number of benefits of those within Australia uh, and basically being able to use them and deploy them and train with them in Australia and that you can get you can go long distances on a wheel wheel vehicle that you wouldn't want to do in a track vehicle. So if you're driving around the Northern Territory for uh, 500 k's from one training area from your base to a training area, you're not going to want to do that in the back of a uh, any sort of track vehicle. Whereas um, an ASLAV or a, even a, or a Bushmaster would probably be able to do that quite happily, carrying a, a squad of troops. Now, um, yeah, that that's that's a, a recommendation for those vehicles for moving around Australia. Now, they it doesn't make them more survival in a hostile environment whereby uh, somebody's actually shooting back at you, but it is a large consideration for uh, what you, uh, why they might have chosen those vehicles. Um, I mean, the, the ASLABs came in and uh, back in the early 90s when, um, so it's a question of, uh, was that a consideration of, I mean, when they were looking at the track vehicles for the Redback and the Lynx, um, is that something they want to be doing or uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, through the entire um, uh, development program for here, the Land 400. You know, most of it takes place behind closed doors, so I don't really have you know good visibility for why it decided to go down the track route. You know, very early in the piece, as opposed to giving consideration uh, to to wheel. Um, you know, there are certain advantages to going with tracks uh, in, a, in the ability of them to go you know to more places than. Uh, you know, wheels will get you and uh, over harsher terrain than wheels will get you. Um, but, and uh, the distribution of weight, uh, because these vehicles are so heavy, uh, tracks allow you to distribute them, uh, distribute the weight much, much more widely than, um, uh, than a wheel vehicle. So that, you know, with uh, these IFVs uh, and tanks too, which are even heavier, the ground pressure isn't all that much different than your family car. No. Um, so, you know, these are all the kinds of considerations within it. But what was the, what, what was the initial decision to uh, look at tracks? You know, I, I had no visibility of that decision, and so I yeah. really can't say. I, I, I agree that uh, yeah, being, by having tracks, you can put a lot more uh, weight on the vehicle, and which means you're putting a lot more armor around it, making it much more protected. Uh, yes. does, but for an Australian environment, uh, as I said, I wouldn't want to be one of the squaddies sitting in the back of uh, uh, a track vehicle driving from uh, from Robertson Barracks somewhere out to uh, 500 k's down the road to, to carry out yeah. some sort of exercise. Um, um, speaking <clears throat> speaking of squatties, um, the the capacity of these is six dismounts, and of course, well, of course, um, an Australian <laughs> um, infantry um, section squad is eight. Are, are we going to be looking at a complete reorganisation of our platoon structure? Well, I think inevitably, yes, yeah, something's going to be done there because uh, you know, for these you know, mechanised uh, battalions, uh, they're going to have to uh, change the uh, squad structure. Um, which, you know, it's, you know, you just do, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not that big of a deal. I mean, I believe the U.S. Marines, the U.S. Marine Corps, their squads are 13, um, you know, so, yeah, there's a they're range probably, of squad sizes. They're probably divided there's into the, two vehicles, so. Yeah, yes, but there's, there's no, you know, one, you know, golden mandatory squad size. Good it job. varies, and then you adjust and you reorganize how you fight based upon based around that. So yeah, so there's going to be some adjustments and some learning, uh, but you know, it's all within the realm of, you know, of not that big a deal. Mm. I can see how your uh, eight-man squad uh, can be reduced to six by uh, having uh, the the vehicle acting as your fire support uh, in the fire support yeah. role rather than, the, rather than the rifleman. But what I would be wondering, wondering about is um, 
that's fine when you have when you're a mechanized infantry battalion and you're actually you're dedicated to uh, you have dedicated vehicles that you train and work with when you're a um when you're just a straight infantry uh unit and your and your cavalry comes along to pick you up as uh, dismounted infantry and take you forward um whether or not I mean, i'm assuming they'll probably train for that sort of activity but it, it still won't be an integral uh, relationship between the two of uh, saying yes we're now rather than being light infantry we're now uh, dismounted infantry that's going to be taken forward by uh, a vehicle that's only carrying six when our squad might be uh, eight people yeah, so. but and but they're going to largely, you know, they're going to, you know, they, they won't have that intimate relationship with the vehicle because they're not <clears throat> mechanized infantry. They're, they're still going to remain light infantry, and then so it's an entirely, you know, different, uh, you know, mode of operation. Mm -hmm. uh, another little thing that I found quite curious is we've gone with boxer for the um, cavalry reconnaissance role, uh, and there's a picture of boxer in the slide. Obviously, that's a wheeled vehicle. Yep. Are we going to be in a slightly weird situation where in um, some terrain, the uh, the infantry is going to be significantly faster than the cavalry? <laughs> um, I, you mean in like very damp uh, terrain? Uh, well, where, you know, any sort of off-road environment, like really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, sometimes that is the case. If you're in the, if you're in an urban setting and there's lots of rubble on the road, uh, even track vehicles will have difficulty negotiating that. And 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 so that's why you do have a mix of, of options, and you try to pick the one that optimizes the situation that you find yourself in. Um, and and so you know, a good commander should be able to have a degree of flexibility in how they um, optimize that force package based upon the uh, upon the situation. But you know, you know, you make these decisions, and then um, you know you have to live with them. And so that's what army's going to have to do because you know, you know, one is wheeled, one is tracked. Yeah, I guess it, it struck me as an odd decision to have a um, an orphan family of vehicles when you you could think one of the IFVs could fill the uh, that cavalry role. Well, you know, if you ask the people in the in the uh, the cavalry world, they would you know, disagree with that <laughs> you know, completely. Sure. Yeah. But you know, maybe that's you know, uh, core pride speaking there. Now, another question with um, with the two options with the, the Redback and the Lynx. So one Ryan Matar, one Hans, Hans Wa? Hanwar. Hanwar, sorry. Hanwar, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so we got uh, South Korean versus German uh, engineering. Um, is there uh, any sort of thoughts about uh, leaning one way or the other, whether it's to uh, open up the production of uh, South Korean uh, military vehicles into the world, wider world, or is it um, just yeah. maintaining? Um, I, I'm quite agnostic to either vehicle. They're, they're both, you know, meet the, the remit. And, uh, you know, somehow uh, those making this decision are going to have to pick one of the two. And uh, I don't know how they're going to do this because they're both highly capable vehicles that seem to be heavily armored as you want, you know, capable to carry roughly, you know, the same amount of stuff. So, you know, uh, you, know you go red back, you go uh, links. I don't know. Uh, what I would say is that you got to go with one of them. You, know, you now, definitely have you, to pick one. Do you uh, think you, Ryan, and, Ryan Mattel? Army needs one of these. Do you think Ryan yep, Mattel has got the uh, got the uh, upper hand by going with the Redback, which being the icon iconic Australian uh, household deadly spider, uh, uh, versus you, the links you, that you mean uh, Hanwha? Uh, you mean, oh, Hanwha, you mean Hanwha? Sorry. Hanwha. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, well, you know, and then they named the uh, the self propelled uh, gun after another spider. Yeah. Uh, nice. So. I'm going. Yes, uh, people who've listened to the podcast uh, before know I keep getting those two mixed up. <laughs> yeah, I mean these are these are you know government decision making. You know, that they're going to look at what the cost is. You know what the uh, local input is into the manufacturing. You know what provides the best job basis. What is the best maintenance down the road? Um, and that's you know and and you know then they're going to make a decision. For somebody like myself looking at these vehicles, they both look like they fit the bill. And I, you know, I don't really care which one you get. Another question I've got is, and myself talking to yeah, mid-ranking um, army officers, and I think you might have had similar conversations, is vehicles keep turning up, you know, the Hawkey and uh, more and more heavy, increasingly heavy vehicles, but the uh, logistics and maintenance and, and all of those 
operational things that need to come with them. The Army's still got a lot of work to do with actually supporting this, this proliferation of vehicles, don't they? Yes, well, and there's again, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know two factors here. Um, you know, you know, one is, you know, the Army doesn't just go off on its own and, and makes these decisions. You know, they follow the, the lead of what government wants. And government wanted a vehicle that's heavily protected to, you know, safeguard the lives of soldiers. And that immediately closes off all kinds of doors uh, because, you know, usually a lighter vehicle is easier to maintain, um, does cost less, and is able to, you know, sustain more easily going forward over the next, you know, few decades. Heavy vehicles are expensive and harder to maintain, but government has repeatedly signaled they want something that's you know heavily protected so army is just following government's uh you know you know wishes here but the other part the question about logistics about sustaining these things you know this is nothing new here because you know army and navy and air force you know the entire adf have neglected logistics since 1901 Right? We have never bothered. Well, the British take care know. of it for us. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. In the First World War, most of the logistics on the Western Front to Australian units was provided by the British. Okay? There are very few incidents um, in the military history of Australia when Australia had to support its forces on its own. Very few. Most of the time, we just got somebody else to do the logistics for us. Now. You know, that comes with problems uh, because, you know, sometimes you can't keep these vehicles going or, you know, your troops might have to eat, you know, herring uh, and they might not like it. Like when we uh, were, were working with the Dutch. Yeah. Uh, but or, or the this uh, is, or, or the country supplying is, the ammunition won't supply it anymore because they're a neutral party and uh, yeah, they don't want to, don't want to participate in whatever also, activity we're involved in. But this is 120 years of Australian logistic policy. So. It's, it's nobody should be thinking that, oh my God, we're getting these heavy vehicles and we're not going to sustain them. I mean, we haven't been able to sustain our equipment uh, forever. Um, we always go to some other bigger country to do the heavy lifting for us. Is so that, if you were serving, you know, if you were serving in Vietnam, you know, the fuel that you used in your APC in your M113 was provided by the Americans. The ammunition is provided by the Americans. The spare parts provided by the Americans. So, you know, that's that's the policy. Now, we could change that policy, but then we'd have to spend more money on logistics, hire, you know, find more soldiers to work in the logistics arms and bear that expense ourselves, which can be done. But until government changes the logistic policy, that's not going to be done. So, you know, don't be surprised. And they can't, and they can't yeah, recruit right. for the uh, people they do need right now. So yeah. it's unlike, unlikely to be able to get more, more people into uniform uh, if they can't meet their num target numbers at the moment. Yeah. And so all you do what other countries do is that you rely on contractors and we rely on contractors to the point that we actually deploy contractors. Uh, you know, you know, to the front or just behind the front, and those contractors do vehicle maintenance. You know, perhaps under fire, and that's the contract <laughs> they sign. And you know, no, you know, Rob, you know, this, you know, this is happening now mm -hmm. uh, in other national armies. And oh, it's I remember happened when, in the past. When, yeah, I remember when the uh, the British brought it in, say from the, uh, the from the base to the foxhole or whatever it was called, the uh, catchphrase, and yeah. suddenly and suddenly they were in places. Then the, uh, the the caterers said, "You know what? We're not going to the foxhole." <laughs> well, and, you know, and you just have to you know change the contract and find mm -hmm. somebody who's willing to do that at the right price. Luckily enough, the uh, labour laws in most Western countries have uh, changed so that you can force people into foxholes. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Huzzah. Um, <laughs> just before we have to go, um, you mentioned uh, in your paper um, the increasing threat of drones on the modern battlefield and that yes. our investment in these vehicles um, really needs to be matched by um, either counter drone, well, essentially some sort of counter drone plan. Yeah. I mean, I don't, you know, even if we, even if these, even if we weren't buying these vehicles, 
right? Even if we didn't own a single vehicle and then the Australian army got around on foot, okay? You would still need some form of counter drone uh, defense uh, for your, your force. Um, it's now become you know, mandatory. Um, if you're going to operate in anything resembling a contemporary <laughs> war fighting environment and you don't have protection overhead, now that protection can come in many forms. Uh, it could become you know, other drones that hunt the other side's drones or you know, uh, electric uh, kind of uh, you know, uh, you know, discharging, uh, you know, dis uh, electricity discharging ordinance that would fry Train, the drones. Trained eagles. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, somebody them. has got... tried, tried, they, they used hawks. Yeah, they, so they it was hawks, that. you're right. Yep. Um, you know, you can shoot you know, a shell that opens up and throws out a net. Um, there's all kinds of options here. Or just you know refine the proximity fuse so that it uh, can back. recognize a, a a you know two kilo drone and detonate uh, in the proximity of that drone. So systems out there exist, but for whatever reason, uh, Australia has not pursued any to date, and this is a massive oversight, and it's becoming more urgent day by day. Because yeah. I mean, anti-aircraft uh, sort of capability is usually situated with the with the artillery. Um, by not, uh, it might be is it something within the actual army itself saying, well, that's their role, rather than saying, no, it's a part of all integral vehicles be, to have this sort of uh, capability of basically air, air protection from small small anti personnel or anti uh, light skin anti armor type of um, v, uh, drones. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's just a thought that's going through my head. Mm. Uh, Rob, have you got any other questions? Uh, no, I'd just like to uh, thank um, Albert so much for uh, these discussions. And we wait with bated breath, I guess, as to what the decision is made and how, how many we end up with, whether it's 450 or 380 or fewer. Or, or zero. You know, I, or I don't, or I doubt. Or do you think we can push the M113 out for another sixty? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you never know. No, no, you don't. Uh, all right. Is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to talk about on this subject, though? No, I'm, I'm, all, I'm, I'm all right, John. Thanks, thanks for having me. Well, thank you very much for the conversation.